You want some epic fantasy? You want some military fantasy? Some spy espionage fantasy? All with some really unique world building? That happens to involve people using bug powers? I got a book for you. Or actually 10 plus. Hello and welcome friends. Uh, welcome to my channel. This is the Pawnings of Pete and I am Pete. As you may have guessed, I'm sure it was not obvious at all. Today we are going to be talking about a series that I read over a year ago, but it still kind of sits with me. Uh, we are going to be talking about another series by the man, the bug, the legend, Adrian Tchaikovsky. This man has definitely earned himself a place to be counted among my favorite authors list. Not only because the man is like a walking prose chameleon, but also because his worlds and everything are just so interesting and so unique. And this series, Shadows of the Apt, is no different. Let me get my notes out so I actually remember what I'm talking about. And let's get on with this. So, first off, Shadows of the App. Is this? Yep, this is the... Yep, cool. What is this book about? You got ten books. Not just one book, ten books. Um, all of varying lengths and length sizes. Some of them are like, you know, four or five hundred pages. Some are like seven or eight hundred pages. But they're not all chunkers. Um, this isn't like Malazan or anything along those lines. Plus, there's also a bunch of tie-in short stories, which there's, I believe, four books of those, which um, one of which is actually co-authored with a bunch of different people. Um, I do not have the list of those people's names, but three of them are three of the books of short stories are written by Tchaikovsky and then one by a bunch of the other people and Tchaikovsky. All set in this world of Shadows of the Apt. Um, it doesn't have a formal name that I know of. Hmm, interesting. Also, additionally, this world technically takes place on the same world that his Echoes of the Fall series does. Uh, though Shadows of the Apt, being the first series that he wrote, doesn't really interact over there too much. Uh, though I do believe some of the short stories in the later short story books actually like connect fully. Um, I have not read those yet. My experience is with the first short story collection and all 10 of the books. The first short story collection mostly takes place before the Shadows of the App series and ties in specifically to book seven, Heirs of the Blade. Uh, there's a bunch of stories that tie into that because there's a specific part of, there's a specific war that happened before this series happened. Anyways, I am getting off track. What is this series about? First of all, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that times they're just they're just a change in times they are a change in. It's it's a series about a war. It's a series about a bunch of different kin what are called kindin, right? So you got beetle kindin, you got wasp kindin. These are races of people of humans um, whose ancestors communed with bugs. And they have some bug-like powers called the art now. And I'll get more into that later. Uh, this, this series is about war with cities, city to city, nation to city, nation to nation, to that type of deal. You got, you got themes of imperialism coming in here. Um, and it's, it's kind of about how does technology change? How does life change? How do characters change over the course of this long, drawn-out war? Advancement of tech is a really big thing with this, um, how war drives the advancement of tech um, in its own specific ways. Um, you have this, this story is kind of set what feels like at the end of an industrial revolution where the Beatles have kind of taken over as the leaders of industry, at least in a certain part of the world that we start in. Um, and you're getting more and more technological advances like steam engines and stuff like that and airships and all this other stuff that is happening um, there are playing things, play around with electricity, all this sort of like these technological improvements that are really cool. And of course, it's also about how the politics changes over time as well within these different, um, places that we're in. There's one specific character, Stenwald Maker, who is a central key, central character, of this entire series. He, how his life changes is really emblematic throughout the entire series, because when you meet him in the first book, he is... He is a mod he is a he is a Cassandra to the city of Collegium. He's like, look, this is coming. These this wasp empire, it's gonna they already took over some other cities. They're coming for us. 
Uh, and over the course of this series, his role shifts and changes as the world around him changes. Additionally, he has some of our main characters are his students, right? You start out with like four, I believe four students um, at the beginning of the first book. And their stories just per, like just rocket off throughout this series in wildly different directions. Um, and it's really interesting to see where they where they are at the end of the series. Whether they're alive or the dead, I can't tell you. Um, so I just mentioned five main characters. Is that all? Um, no, not really. There is a sixth called Thalric, who is an agent of the Lost Empire. He is also a main character throughout. Um, and then there are other people that weave in and out throughout the story. Um, I would say that this is actually kind of one of the weaknesses of the first four books, because he tries to focus on these six main characters a lot. And it kind of splits. It, it's splits. It splits the focus because he's not able to fully tell stories for everybody. Popping in about structure after the first four, which is kind of like a complete arc to this series. The structure of the different books really changes. The next three books is they're more character driven by like one or two characters rather than more plot driven like the first four books. Uh, and then by the after the seventh one, so eight, nine and ten, those are very much more. Uh, plot driven books where he kind of zooms out, not necessarily zooms out. He, he, he adds in more characters. There's more side POVs and he's kind of telling the story of the, the war again. Um, I, I do think that eight, nine, 10 are a lot better for what he did. He, you can, you, you can tell he grew as a writer from going to the first four, which felt sometimes all over the place, but with some really, really great moments. And then the next cup, the next three, which were very focused on these specific characters, him developing these characters and us staying with these characters that we love. Um, and then the, the eight, nine, ten of just like, all right, let's bring it all together and go at this again. <laughs> uh, it was really just that's one of the aspects of the series that I really love about how he split it up so that it wasn't just like dragging all along, but it feels like there's different arcs to the series. Um, the other thing that I think I, I kind of alluded to, he does this thing with f what I would call fringe POVs or side POVs, where he'll do one or two chapters throughout the book of these other random characters that flesh out the world and eventually play into the grand narrative of everything. They are not worthless by any means. Um, they, these, these side POVs are very, very valuable in their own right and are just great, honestly. Um, the, the, they allow you to see multiple different sides to everything more than just the sides that we already see from the six POVs that we have. Um, so don't, don't sleep on those, but it's, they're, they're great. Um, let's talk about the setting a little bit, uh, which is one of the things that is most vibrant about this. Uh, one of the two things that is most vibrant about this, because after like a year and a half, two years of reading it, there, there are definitely things that stick in my mind, which is why I'm like, oh, this, this this is really something that I keep coming back to. I keep thinking about. This is really one of my favorite series. Uh, so setting, we have insects. <laughs> Not everybody's favorite thing. Um, we we know Tchaikovsky loves bugs. Like we know Tchaikovsky loves spiders, uh, among other things, and just entomology in general. Uh, if you've ever heard, I mean, you've probably heard of Wheel of Children of Time because like that's his. That's the big one that's really popular for him. But it's not the best entry point. Anyways. Uh, depending on your reading tastes. Bugs. Are there a lot of bugs in this series? And the answer is no. There are some giant bugs, right? So the scorpion kinden rides scorpions, and those pop up every once in a while, but very rarely. Um, there are some scenes with some giant mantises. Um, and then there's mentions of big wasps, big ants, other things like this. But outside of maybe the mantis scenes, there's I don't think there's anything that is crazy ah, in terms of bug content um maybe there's a wasp scene in a giant a horde of giant wasps in the later books but in one of the later books but other maybe other than that so don't this is not oh my gosh bugs everywhere because the people the characters in these stories are human um they just have a little bit of magic in them which they don't call magic, called the art, which, you know, like I said, wasps, they shoot stingers, they can fly. Beetles, they have things. The, the easiest one is just, there's a bunch of different races that can fly. 
Um, and then their like skin color and some other stuff is dictated by their kindin as well. Um, like flies are small in stature. Ants are like solid depending on the type of ant. Um, stuff like that. Yeah, beetle, wasp, spider, grasshopper, scorpion, fly, ant. It goes on. Oh, ants have a mind link too. That's a really cool thing. Uh, whatever. And then, okay, so there's the art, right? That's a thing that to us is magic, but they don't call it magic. They just call it the art. And this is where the big, the, the title of the series gets into it. There are two different type of people. You have people that are what is called apt, which are able to use technology, right? They are engineering minded type of people that um, they're, they're them and their kindin sometimes they're really good at baking things. Or they can be really good at making things. Um, and then there are the inapt, which these inapt have this connection to the greater magic of the world. Because besides the whole art stuff, there's another layer of this nebulous magic, right? This soft magic that is all, what is this? Um, that the inapt are able to connect to. Downside is the inapt can't operate technology to the point of like, there are inapt that cannot open mechanical door handles, it is that like extreme. And then the apt physically cannot like mentally cannot process the fact that magic exists. And this is like, there are two characters. There's an inapt and an apt that are kind of like together sort of that like it's, it's difficult for them because one of them literally cannot acknowledge that magic exists. He is mentally, he can't process it, but he has to trust her because he just has to. Um, it's, it's really interesting. And this is one of the other big push and pull themes of the series of um, just the coming of the age to the apt, um, because this is kind of like the, the industrial revolution was the apt inventing the crossbow, the Beatles inventing the crossbow and overthrowing their masters um, that were enslaving them. Apt versus, versus inapt is very, very much a major theme of the series. Not like versus inapt, but like, I don't know. It's not like direct head on versus, but it's just like the push and pull of the different cultures slash um, sensibilities. But yeah, as and like as I alluded to, there's a lot there's a big rich history in this series that is alluded to, talked about um, and kind of you see all these different places where different kindin live and how they live, um, how they live together, how they live apart how that affects their politics. Like there's a lot of really great stuff with the world building here. Um, and then I think that's it on my notes, but what else? Um, I think the battles are super, super vivid for me with Tchaikovsky. Uh, those, this is where those fringe POVs really come in handy. So you have POVs from our main characters and then other people's side characters throughout the battle that are just giving you all these different perspectives. Um, and really fleshing out all the individual sides of the battle and showing you what's happening. This happens many times throughout the series. Uh, I won't tell you how many, but there are some sieges and some air battles because eventually we do get airplanes in this in the series, which is really cool. I love it. They sit like these battles sit with me and I remember them and I can replace some of them in my head. It's really cool. Uh, and there's sacrifices and um, tragedies and victories and all this other jazz that happens in battles, you know, it's just so great. Um, I really love this series. If you have time, pick it up. Like it's not, you can start with the first four books, see if you like them, maybe read Scarab Path, the fifth one as well, um, and see how it changes and be like, maybe I can get on board with this. I think Tchaikovsky is a really good writer. And this is kind of like, this is, this is a really underrated epic fantasy series. Um, like I said, like you have that, objective I, I don't know you, there there's so many things about this series that there's a lot of people out there I'm like why haven't you read this why isn't this popular uh but it, it's just really good um i do have a spoiler discussion and a non-spoiler um ranking of all of the covers because there's a lot of them um that i did with uh, my friends anitha and bengus khan they've been really great and they, they both read it around the same time i did and uh, it, it was such a great journey. Please read this. It's great. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Good night. <laughs>